Good evening, beloved. We are uh, glad that you are here uh, this afternoon as I was uh, just wasting some time on social media, because that's about all you do on social media is waste time. But anyway, I was wasting some time on social media, uh, and I saw a, a meme, a picture of a guy jumping out of a burning building, and it said, this is 2020. Uh, and then he hits a trampoline, and it bounces him right back into another burning building and says, this is 2021. Um, I hope that's not true, and I pray that's not true, but uh, surely has started out to be quite an adventure in the first, uh, what, 10 days of, uh, of the new year. However, uh, the Lord's Day is an opportunity to, to set aside all those cares and those anxieties, to set aside all those frustrations and those worries, uh, and to come uh, to Christ uh, and to be reminded that it is the gospel that as Kim was playing, makes us glad of heart. Uh, and so we hope that uh, our time together this evening uh, will make you glad in Jesus, uh, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the friend of sinners, and the Savior uh, of our souls. We do have a few announcements that I want to cover before we enter into worship. If you turn back to that announcements page on uh, page 9 in your bulletin, just a few uh uh, a few housekeeping uh, points of uh, dates and uh, such for you to be aware of. Uh, next Monday, January the 18th, uh, the church office will be closed uh, due to Martin Luther King Jr. Day, as it is each and every year. And also, we're asking you to go ahead and begin to prepare your hearts to partake in the Lord's Supper. Uh, we are going to observe communion during the morning worship on Sunday, January the 24th, and so that's two weeks away, uh, but that will be during the morning service on January the 24th. Uh, please be in prayer over the uh, annual joint meeting that we have with the elders and the deacons and their wives. We're uh, trying to figure out what's best uh, to do uh, regarding that meeting uh, with the uh, increased numbers of uh, the COVID pandemic within our community. And also, I wanted to draw your attention to the flowers. Uh, the flowers uh, this Sunday has been given to the glory of God, of course, but in loving memory of uh, our dear brother Dave Harrison. Uh, five days ago on January 5th, Dave would have celebrated his 82nd birthday. Uh, and just a reminder of how much we miss that dear uh, saint being with us. And now, uh, as dawn comes, let us uh, prepare our heart for worship very quickly as he comes for our call to worship. Our call to worship this evening from God's word comes from Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, here as our Lord calls us into his presence to come and worship him. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what, may, what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, and before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all round and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, 
holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. Thus far the reading of God's word. But let us also worship God together as the worship in heaven is just described to us. Let us join them. As we turn to hymn 17, praise the Lord, ye heavens, adore him. Please stand as you are able, and we will sing this together. standing and let's pray together father in heaven indeed you are worthy for you are our lord and god and therefore we come this evening to give you the glory and the honor that you deserve for all power and majesty belong to you and as we imagine how powerful you are we can have just a glimpse of that power by looking at at your creation and how you have created all things and only by your will do all things created exist. And so, Father, as we come to celebrate your majesty, as we come to bask in your grace and your glory, we pray that we would continue through word and deed, through our prayers and our song, through our listening to your word read and preached, that we would be those that join the angelic course saying that you are the very definition of holiness and that you are the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Father, find our worship pleasing in thy sight. Enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth, we pray. Amen. As we continue in our worship this evening, let us now uh, take those hymnals again and turn to 172, uh, and let us sing, Let us love and sing and wonder.
please be seated. Well, if you'd uh, turn your bulletins, if you're not there already, to page six, we will confess our faith together. And this evening, uh, we'll be confessing our faith, what we believe the Bible teaches about the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. Uh, of course, when God created the universe, and we've already read about and, and sung to God about his majesty and creating everything, God created in seven days, but God really created everything in six days, and the seventh day he rested. And of course, God did not rest because he needed to, but God created us uh, where we do need rest. Uh, we human beings need rest, and God has uh, set a pattern for us in this way as well. So uh, I will read, uh, we will be reading from the Shorter Catechism, uh, question 59 and 60. I will read the question, and then we'll all respond together. It's printed on page 6. In question 59, which day of the seven hath God appointed to be the weekly Sabbath? From the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ, God appointed the seventh day of the week to be the weekly Sabbath, and the first day of the week ever since to continue to the end of the world which is the Christian Sabbath. How is the Sabbath to be sanctified? The Sabbath is to be sanctified by a holy resting all that day, even from such worldly employments and recreations as are lawful on other days, and spending the whole time in the public and private exercises of God's worship, except so much as is to be taken up in the works of necessity and mercy. Well, let's uh, go to our Lord together to pray this evening. Our Lord, our Heavenly God, Father, we come to you, and as we just profess our faith about what we believe the Bible teaches about the Sabbath, Father, we're reminded in, in the book of Hebrews that ultimately the Sabbath rest points to our eternal state with you, as we're with you in glory in, in an eternal Sabbath, Lord, of resting from the cares of of this fallen world and taking up the entire time in, in worship and in rest and fellowship. And Father, we know even now that our, our Sabbath, our, our rest from our own works is found in Christ, your Son who lived, Lord, who is our righteousness, the one who lived and died for us and is seated at your right hand, that we need not even attempt to make ourselves right or make ourselves worthy because we're not worthy. But Father, we are so thankful that we who are sinners can admit to who we are, uh, that you can show us more and more who we are, and, and we can despair, but Lord, I pray that we despair more and more of who we are in ourselves, but we have more and more confidence in your love for us, and of course your word teaches that is why you sent Jesus, not because we're good and we need a little help, but to rescue people who are sinners. And Father, we remind ourselves also that the reason Jesus came was, in fact, not to save those who are healthy or righteous, but to save those who are sick. So, Lord, we come to you grateful for our righteousness, which is your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we do come also, and we remind ourselves that you care for us, and therefore we're to cast our burdens, which are too heavy for us, we're to cast them upon you because they are not too heavy for you. Uh, Father, we do have, uh, of course, several families in our church family who are dealing with uh, sickness, partic particularly with COVID, uh, whether that is people who are dealing with the, the virus right now and have it, or people who are quarantining, or people who are waiting to find out if they have it or not. Lord, we want to lift them up to you. 
Father, as we look at this uh, virus, as we've been dealing with this for nearly a year now, <clears throat> we, uh, it, it's a good reminder of the fallen world we live in. And um, Father, we do want to praise you that, uh, relatively speaking, things have been, have been uh, a little quiet for us, and we're grateful for that. Uh, Father, we're grateful for your watch over Dillon Christian School and over the, the public schools here in, in Dillon County and, and Robson County and, and the homeschoolers. And, uh, and Father, and in this whole thing, we are so grateful that by and large, uh, from what I understand, this is rare, but that this virus uh, has such small effect on little ones. We are so grateful. And Lord, I know we'd be on our knees begging for that to be the case but we're not so and we thank you that in your mercy with all that happened in, in 2020 as pastor matt just brought up uh, we're so grateful that this this worldwide virus uh, doesn't have much effect uh, at all on, on little ones so we're thankful for that grace from you lord but we do pray for our families who are who are dealing with it now we do pray for uh, continued grace for them for healing if you would lord for comfort for them uh, we can pray that you continue to watch over us uh, as a church, as a, uh, our schools, and just families. Father, we do pray for uh, your churches, and we pray for First Presbyterian Church uh, for this upcoming year. Uh, again, as has just been said, this, this year just started, 2021, and, and it's already had um, a lot of things going on. Lord, we pray uh, that... If possible, there might be stability. Uh, we know that your word talks about praying that things might be such that the gospel would go forth and people would be able to worship and lead quiet lives. But Lord, we don't know what you in your providence have for us. We know that you will be faithful and we know you will save your people and grow your church. And we pray that you would keep us uh, faithful to you, Lord, in our giving in our attendance, Lord, we ask for wisdom. We ask for the mind of Christ that we would, that your spirit, Lord, would just be manifest in us and we would be uh, walking Ebenezer's. We'd be signposts to the God of the universe, the one God. Um, Father, help us to see this time as a time of opportunity, uh, a time for repentance and for thought, and but also a time for for sharing the one who can save people from ultimate destruction. Um, Lord, I pray that for myself and for all of us that we will see this as not just a, a hurdle to get over so we can get back to quiet lives necessarily. We don't. We thank you for when we've had that, Lord, but we pray we'd see this time as a time to share with those who desperately need to be saved. Lord, we do pray for our country, and we want to give thanks that we've been able to live in a country where we've been able to uh, read your word and meet and preach the gospel and do all sorts of things for centuries now. And even a, a country that was founded on principles found in the Bible, and many Christians, and uh, a godly heritage as well. Uh, not a perfect country, but one that we can look at and see your blessing upon. And um, Lord, we see that... <clears throat> seeming to deteriorate all the time and uh, rapidly. And again, Father, our prayer is, uh, if it be within your will, that that might be curbed, uh, the deterioration. And we pray for your people, Lord, again, that uh, you would help us to be those who, who our hope is not ultimately in a man uh, or in our politics or in our country even. We are thankful, Lord, for our country, but we do pray again that you'd help us from despairing knowing that there is a king who reigns right now uh, you are not overthrown lord you are sovereign over everything so help us when we we tend to despair uh, not to do so uh, father we pray that um, that tonight you would encourage us would you strengthen us for this week which is to come during this dark cold time of the year uh, would we be encouraged by our risen savior would your spirit enable us to worship? And Father, we give you all thanks, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you would take your hymnals again one uh, last time, and we will turn to hymn number 565, and we will be singing together.
uh, all for Jesus. So if, stand as you are able and we'll sing together hymn number seated. If you'll open your copies of God's Word to the ninth chapter of the Acts narrative, the 19th chapter of the Acts narrative, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 22 this evening, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 22. If you were with us last week, you uh, were a part of a a whirlwind journey, it seemed, as we traveled those uh, thousand plus miles with the Apostle Paul. You remember he journeyed there through Ephesus and into uh, Caesarea, and then he probably went to Jerusalem, we believe, and then traveled north to Antioch, and then he went about inland through Iconium and Lystra and Derby, and then he heads back to uh, Asia Minor, back to Ephesus again. And you recall, I hope, that last week when we were in Ephesus, we were introduced to a a uh, young uh, Egyptian convert who had been preaching there in the synagogues in Ephesus named Apollos. You'll notice that uh, as we journey into the 19th chapter that he's moved on to Corinth. Uh, but here it is that, that Luke begins to record for us this, uh, this time that Paul has, these three years that Paul has here in the city of Ephesus. We don't have to go into much detail about the city in and of itself at this point, but we need to understand that it is a great city within the known world. It's a strategic port city within the known world, and Luke wants us to see, I believe, especially in these uh, first 22 verses, how the gospel comes to uh, this city, and of course, as it spreads uh, through the world. And so we're going to read our text together, but before we do, uh, let us pray that God will give us ears to hear. Father in heaven, we do uh, give you thanks for your word that is right and true. Uh, Father, we thank you that you so quickly reveal yourself to us. You so quickly tell us about Christ. You so, so beautifully tell us how we are to live as Christians within this world. And so as we come to... Uh, Acts chapter 19, Father, we pray that we would see the ministry of the Apostle Paul, we would see his preaching, we would see uh, even the miracles that he performed, and that we would be reminded first and foremost that the same God 
of Acts chapter 19 is the God who reigns supreme today. And the same God of Acts chapter 19 that calls a people unto repentance is the same God that calls us to repentance day by day. And so, Father, let us see you clearly. Give us ears to hear by your Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Again, reading those 22 verses, if you don't have your own copies of God's Word or a pew Bible there before you, the Scripture is there on page 7 of your bulletin. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the inerrant Jews, exorcists, undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul proclaims, Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to fifty thousand pieces of silver so the word of the lord continued to increase and prevail mightily now after these events paul resolved in the spirit to pass through macedonia and achaia and go to jerusalem saying after i have been there i must also see rome and having sent into macedonia two of his helpers timothy and erastus he himself stayed in asia for a while the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, admittedly, there is uh, much going on within our text. If our text last week was a whirlwind journey traveling with the Apostle Paul, here it is that we're in a whirlwind of ministry uh, within the city of Ephesus. But as you see in these uh, 22 verses, Luke... The author of the Acts of the Apostles tells us really how things are happening uh, within three main headings. He tells us what's going on in the synagogues. He tells us what's going on there in the hall of Tyrannus. And then he tells us about these great wonders that are being proclaimed. And that's how I want to handle our text before us. Of course... If you notice, I'm handling that a little out of order, and we're starting there uh, in the synagogue. 
We're starting there in the synagogue. You know, here it is that if you recall our time in the city of Corinth, you recall that many of the thing, the same things that are happening here in the synagogue at Ephesus are those things that had already happened in the city of Corinth. Paul finds himself there preaching boldly, teaching boldly uh, to the Jews and the Jewish believers there in the synagogue. And just as he did in Corinth, we saw within our text Paul having to uh, leave the synagogue because of the Jews' unbelief. And after he leaves the synagogue, of course, just as he did in Corinth, he turns his attention uh, to the Gentiles and, to, and begins proclaiming the gospel there amongst those people. But here it is that in Ephesus, Luke gives us some description of how Paul is preaching there in the synagogues that deserves for us to pay some attention to. If you look back at verse 8, as he enters into the synagogue, and for three months he preaches there, he speaks boldly, it says, and it says that he is reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Now, uh, of course, that is uh, unique now to what Luke has already written about the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He is giving us some descriptive words about how he is indeed preaching uh, and teaching and proclaiming. Uh, the kingdom of God, he tells us that he is reasoning and persuading. Um, I think one commentator is correct when he says that this is some sort of uh, apologetics that is taking place. Uh, he's going there into the synagogues and he is trying to understand what these Jewish people believe, why they believe it. He's analyzing their understanding maybe of the Old Testament. He's analyzing their beliefs and who Jesus is and who uh, they are, and he begins to uh, persuade them by trying to uh, take apart, break down those false notions and those false beliefs. And he, he begins to teach as he uh, establishes a structure in which he could now go back to those Old Testament texts that they knew so well, and that he could then begin to uh, proclaim truths. Um, you know, it's one of those things, isn't it? Uh, much like uh, our, our text this morning with the baptism of Jesus, uh, what, is, what do all the Christian movies seem to depict? They seem to depict Jesus walking into the waters and being immersed. Well, as Presbyterians, especially as Westminster Presbyterians, we sit and pause and we go, well, wait, what, what's going on? And we have to almost deprogram ourselves from that normal Christianese version, that Sunday school version of the story, and really delve into the text to understand what is going on. The water being poured as Jesus sits in probably what we would say about uh, calf-deep water in the Jordan. And, and in much the same way, Paul is needing to deprogram these Jewish believers. He's needing to analyze, to see uh, where they are going array within their beliefs about God and their beliefs about Christ and their beliefs about themselves and that he may go uh, and correct them using the very same thing that they know so well, the Old Testament. And so here it is that he's reasoning with them, he's analyzing with them, he's, he's preaching and persuading them and how is he doing that? It's very unique, isn't it, that Paul or Luke tells us that Paul is speaking boldly. Boldly. See it again there in verse 8, don't you? Right before those two words, reasoning and persuading, he says that they speak, or Paul is speaking to them boldly about the kingdom of God. Here it is that we are introduced to this word, and it's going to be. Uh, Luke's favorite word to describe the Apostle Paul's ministry from uh, this point forward. It is a proclamation that Paul, understanding what might take place as he begins to reason and persuade uh, these Jewish 
believers there in the synagogue that he has no fear of man that has trickled into his heart as he begins to preach. Now, you must understand the history of Paul's ministry up to this point. He has indeed been beaten. He has indeed been uh, ran out of the city. His life has uh, hung on the fringes, hasn't it? As he's been left outside of the city to die. And so if there was a man that would be fearful of the reaction of men, it would surely be Paul. But Luke tells us that as he is full of the Spirit and as he is teaching and preaching uh, here about the kingdom of God, he preaches in a way that there is no fear of these men within his heart. You remember as Paul writes to this same church in Ephesus in his letter of the Ephesians in chapter 6, he asks them to pray for what? He asks them to pray for his preaching to continue to be bold. And here it is that he is preaching boldly amongst them. So that bold preaching that they know so well is the the bold preaching that he desires to continue uh, within his ministry amongst the different cities. And, And so here it is that Luke tells us without fear of men, Paul is preaching. And what is he preaching? He's preaching the kingdom of God. So Paul is here in the synagogue in verse 8 and he is boldly reasoning and he is boldly persuading and he is boldly speaking and he is speaking all about uh, the kingdom of God. Now, um, if we are, again, Old Testament Christians that know our Old Testament well, and I hope you do, uh, we are catching exactly what Uh, Luke is doing here as he writes this phrase, because this is an Old Testament phrase. The kingdom of God. It's the Old Testament's way of proclaiming the idea that God is king. And that God would send His Redeemer Son who would rule and reign over His people and all creation. It's, It's chock full of theology. It's chock full of the sovereignty of God and it finds its base within the Old Testament. And so here it is that Paul is preaching and he's preaching the kingdom of God and he's preaching that the Messiah uh, has come and that Messiah is Jesus and that Jesus now is ruling uh, and reigning over his people. Not only is this found within the Old Testament text, you Remember when we've been journeying through Mark's first chapter, even those first handful of verses, that as Mark is proclaiming what the ministry of John is there by the Jordan, he says that John is proclaiming that the kingdom of God is at hand. Later within that same chapter of Mark chapter 1, as Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem, the first words that he says is that the kingdom of God is at hand. It is that the Messiah has come, that He has come to lay down His life so that He may take His throne. And and here it is that Paul is preaching that boldly here amongst the, the Ephesians, and especially here and amongst those gathered within the synagogue. But understand that Paul doesn't stop here in Ephesus with this message of sovereignty and of salvation. If we look back all the way at the end of the Acts of the Apostles, we have just uh, less than a dozen chapters left there in chapter 28, that last chapter. The Acts of the Apostles concludes with Paul under house arrest, uh, awaiting his death. He's in a home in Rome, and, the, and Luke concludes by saying simply that Paul is there preaching the kingdom of God, proclaiming the kingdom of God, and teaching with regard to Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. You see, here it is that as, as Paul turns his attention to this rich Old Testament phrase, the kingdom of God. He is pushing us to understand that 
that, that this is King Jesus that is being set before us. That this is the promised Messiah that has been introduced to us. And the only call that we have as Christians is to submit to this King, to bow a knee to Him, and to proclaim Him as our Lord and Savior. And then so, and so often Luke tells us how the response of these people are. And he does that for us in verse 9. If we're in verse 8, preaching and teaching in the synagogue, verse 9 is the response of the people. It said, but when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, Paul withdrew from them and took the disciples with him. Now, you, you see the language, don't you? They became stubborn and they began to speak out against the way. Now, at first glance, or maybe at first hearing, we would think that this has everything to do about the way in which Christians live. And there is a way that Christians live. There is a way in which we walk, and it's proclaimed in our scriptures to be a narrow way that leads to eternal life. And, and of course that means that there are certain things that we don't do anymore. There are certain places we don't go anymore, certain ways we talk that we don't talk like that anymore. But, but notice that's not exactly what Luke is implying here when they begin to speak evil of the way. It's not the Christian way of life. It is the way, the truth, and the life. It is Jesus Himself that they begin to speak evil of. You know, I think that Psalm 16 is a prophecy of sorts, and it says that you make known to me the way of life. And I think in a grander scale, the psalmist is not proclaiming this this message of how to walk in this life, and of course it has those undertones, but it's saying you make known to me the way, capital W, way of life. You make known to me Jesus. And Paul, as he is proclaiming Jesus here in the synagogue, these people begin to speak evil of Christ himself. And at this moment of blasphemy and and, and sin is uh, in repudiation that Paul grabs the disciples that he has met in verses 1 through 7 uh, and he begins to leave. And just like he did in Corinth, you remember, where does he go in Corinth after he leaves the synagogue? He goes next door. Well, in the same way, here it is that Paul goes next door again. And so. Luke tells us how the gospel comes to the synagogues, and then it tells us how the gospel comes to uh, the public of Ephesus. And it's there for us as we conclude verse 9 and move on into verse 10. Tyrannus, in this hall, this meeting place that Tyrannus owns there in Ephesus, Paul preaches for two years. Now, one of the commentators uh, draw, or drew out from uh, Greek manuscripts. If you know anything about what we call textual criticism, um, if you don't know anything about textual criticism, ask me later. Uh, but if you, if you know anything about textual criticism, what we have before us in the ESV is a good and solid and reliable source of what the earliest and the best manuscripts that have been found have said. Well, in some of those earliest manuscripts, it's been brought out that Paul preaches in this hall of Tyrannus between the hours of 11 in the morning until about 4 uh, in the afternoon. And, and I, I think that's important. I think that's important to understand. Because it, it, it shows us a little bit about what life is uh, around the Mediterranean. Because if you know anything about life in the Mediterranean, and we can go back to some of our early church historical fathers and learn much about it, 11 to 4 is nap time. Well, wouldn't that be glorious? Um, 11 to 4 is nap time. And so if you were, were to journey or, or, or cruise the Mediterranean these days, if you 
got off your cruise ship and you wanted to go shopping between the hours of 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., you would be highly uh, disappointed because everybody's asleep. I remember uh, in seminary we had a professor named Dr. Old. Uh, Dr. Old was a professor of worship, uh, and, and he was old, may I add. But nonetheless, uh, he would break for lunch at 11 a.m., and you would come back to class at 3 p.m., uh, and he would always tell us that this is how the Europeans do it, and we should do it better like them. Um, and so he would take a siesta, he would call it, a, a nap time uh, in between the lectures of the class. And so that is what's going on. Between the, the hours of 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., the, the world, as it seems, is napping, and yet Paul is preaching. And you think about that for a minute. What has to happen... Uh, for this to be a success, well, the Spirit has to work, doesn't it? The, the Spirit has to draw these people who are used to napping between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. It has to draw them into this hall of Tyrannus to listen to uh, the Apostle Paul. And, and what do we see as we journey into uh, verse 10? that the Spirit does indeed move amongst the people here in Ephesus. Because all of a sudden, nap time is a thing of the past. You see, when you close down your business at 11 a.m., you don't go home to take your siesta. You go to hear the Apostle Paul. So much so uh, that, that Luke tells us that all of the residents of Asia have heard the word of the Lord from this hall in the middle of siesta time, in Ephesus. You know, I, I, when I read this about the Apostle Paul, I think back to, to Francis Schaeffer. If you don't know Francis Schaeffer's name, we uh, are indebted to him in, in much of the work of the PCA um, today, but he was the cat's meow in the early 70s. Uh, he was the man uh, of the Reformed world uh, in the 70s, and so uh, here was a man that was actually quite strange looking, uh, lived in Switzerland, wore uh, strange Swiss clothing, I guess you could say, uh, and what he would do is he would preach in his home there in Switzerland in the middle of the day, and, and you think, well, that wouldn't have much uh, success today, and, and maybe it wouldn't. But it did have much success here in the life of Francis Schaeffer. And so uh, all these people, all these intellectuals, all these communists, all these anarchists, all these musicians, all these philosophers, they would come uh, and they would, they would attempt to debate Francis Schaeffer. And, and he would preach day by day there in his house in Switzerland. And, and there was tremendous success. No matter what the success Francis Schaeffer had, it cannot be said that all of Switzerland heard the gospel through Francis Schaeffer. But notice the way that Luke writes. All of the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord because of the faithfulness of the Apostle Paul to preach here uh, in the hall of Tyrannus. And as the preaching continues and as the people hear, you, you notice, don't you, that these Signs and wonders supporting the gospel advancing begin to take place. And that's the third and final thing we need to look at very briefly. There's multiple stories going on, so we'll handle them uh, as, as quickly as we can. These various incidences happen before us, and, and one of those is right there in verse 1 through 7 where Paul is uh, introduced to these 12 disciples that have been baptized uh, with John's baptism. Well, these things are paralleling for us beautifully, aren't they? Well, John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. And we saw even Apollos and, and, and the phrase being shared about him as well, that Apollos had been baptized with the baptism of John. And we said that there was teaching that was missing even within uh, the, the preaching of Apollos. And we even said last week that, 
That maybe, just maybe, it had something to do with the outpouring of the Spirit upon the believers. Well, here it is that that is being proclaimed to us again. Paul asked these disciples, have you been filled with the Spirit? And they said, well, no, we haven't even, we've never even heard of the Holy Spirit. And, and at that moment, he begins to uh, preach to them and teach them about the Lord Jesus and on, on hearing, they believed and they were then baptized to show uh, continuity within the covenant community. And, and as Paul laid hands on them, of course commissioning them, setting them apart to continue in their ministry of disciples, not now for the baptism of John, but the baptism of Jesus, they're filled with the Spirit. And what do they do? They begin to speak in tongues. They begin to prophesy. Now, I don't think that this is some sort of uh, two-stage ministry going on. I don't think this is a, uh, a norm for the Christian life that is being proclaimed. I think this is very much what Jesus promised would happen in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That there will be disciples being made in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the utter ends of the earth. Well, if you've been keeping up, we've reached the ends of the earth. We've reached the continent of Asia. We have, we have now gone into the territory in which Jesus has said we would go and what has happened within these regions. Well, in Jerusalem, the day of Pentecost, the Spirit is poured out and the apostles begin to speak in tongues. And then we move, don't we, into the household of Cornelius. And there the Spirit falls upon those gathered and they begin to speak in tongues. And then you remember as we journey into Samaria, that as the gospel is being presented, as people are believing, as they are being baptized... They are then full of the Spirit and they begin to speak in tongues. This is a repetition of Pentecost, it seems, always in the presence of the apostles. Please note that. It's always in the presence of the apostles. But it's a repetition of Pentecost showing those, those steps outward that Jesus has indeed presented to us. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now to the ends of of the earth but it's not just these these disciples speaking in tongues but you see don't you how these extraordinary miracles now understand as we get into verse 11 every miracle is extraordinary in and of itself but Luke here begins to uh, describe these miracles before us that are being done at the hands of Paul or by the hands of Paul and he gives us one illustration doesn't he that these handkerchiefs, these aprons, I think uh, we, we would say kind of like a sweatband that the like athletes wear on their foreheads. That's kind of what we're looking at here. These sweatbands have been given from the Apostle Paul to people and they carry them home and as the sick and as the uh, ones filled with demons are touching these sweatbands, these aprons, these handkerchiefs, they're being healed. And it's, and it's all, isn't it, this demonstration of the, uh, the apostleship of, of Paul here within Ephesus. This is an, an extraordinary revival that's taking place. And not only is there these miracles, not only is there these speaking in tongues, but then there's these exorcisms happening. Uh, the seven sons of Sceva, the high priest, uh, at least that's what he's claiming himself to be, it seems. Paul is casting out demons. And, 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 and at hearing this, these, these seven sons begin to try to do the very thing. And you, you see how they even say it, don't you? I tell you to come out by the power of the name of the one that Paul is preaching and and you get this look into the reaction of, of the evil ones as they say, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And of course it's 
drawing our attention to these unconverted men trying to mimic, trying to copy, trying to use for their own personal purposes the ways of the Lord. And, and then you notice, right, that there's these cults that are, that are coming to hear Paul. Ephesus in and of itself is a, a huge gathering for these cults within the known world. These people who believe in magic, it says here in our text. And, and what, what do they begin to do? They begin to, to call out their spells, to, to tell their secrets. We used to play a little game on youth trips growing up called Black Magic. And the, and the secret of Black Magic was you could guess what item someone was thinking of uh, by just simply another one pointing to it. Well, the trick was it always came after the black object, black magic. You see, it's pretty corny, but all the young little sixth graders, they, they just thought you were the man. Um, but but well, how do you ruin the magic trick? Well, you tell them how it's, how it's happening. And that's what it says is going on here. These people who believed in magic began to tell the people gathered there listening to Paul, here's how he did these things. There's nothing mystical about it, and it even show you the, the extremity in which we will go to leave these formal ways and to follow Christ. We'll, we'll throw our books into the fire. I think it says that there's 50,000 pieces of silver is the equivalent of how many books are being burned here within the city. And so all these extraordinary things are happening, and it's revealing to us the way the gospel has now come to Ephesus and this revival that is happening here amongst the city. And, and you see how all these extraordinary things have come only at the proclamation of the gospel. You see, it's easy to get caught up in all these exorcisms and all these book burnings and, and all of these people that are speaking in tongues. It's easy to get caught up in all of those things. But you see, all of those things were temporary. But what stood firm through the rest of Paul's ministry and what stands firm even today is the preaching and the proclamation of the Word of God. Where God Himself speaks to us through His Word. I love what the Baptist John Piper says. If you want to hear God audibly speak to you, read your Bibles out loud. It is God speaking. It is God being proclaimed as, as men stand in the pulpit each and every Sunday and, and understand this, that we might not see tongues being poured out like fire upon the churches and we might not see exorcisms being the norm of the Christian life, but what do we see when the Word of God is proclaimed? We see powerful public salvations happening because the prophet said it so clearly. God's word will go out and it will never return to its void. It will always accomplish, to accomplish the purposes that it was designed to accomplish and it will always show us the way. And when we say the way, we of course are using it in the same context of Luke here. We're using way with a capital W. It will always show you Jesus. And it will always lead you to eternal life. May God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, show us the magnificence of the fruit that can be born by the preaching and the proclamation of His Word. Let us pray to that end. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the opportunity to come to this text. And we thank you that we can see the marvels of your hand and of your sovereignty that takes place within the life of the church. Father, we do not uh, desire for these extraordinary gifts, but what we do desire, O oh Lord, is what you have promised, that we would be a church that proclaims the Word of God, that we would be a church that proclaims the truths of God, and that we might know that it never returns to us empty. And so, Father, show us the fruits of conversions. Give us the opportunity to to hear the public declarations of your salvation. And Father, we pray that we would be a people to give you all the honor and the glory for the work that you are doing here at First Presbyterian Church and around the world. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Amen. Please stand and receive the Lord's blessing. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.